Well, it's important for you folks to know that it was an honest mistake. Uh, my wife and I, we were in the process of moving from our town home in uh, Wake Forest, North Carolina, and we were moving to a new rental home in Clayton, North Carolina. And, and as is the habit, whenever you move, you gotta find boxes, right? You gotta have something to put your stuff in. And, and so uh, we had run out of boxes, and, and Zandy had said, uh, I need you to go get some boxes. And I thought to myself, I know where I'm going to do it. I drive past this place every day on the way to the office. It's called the ABC Package Store. So I just knew this is where I've got it. I'm going to go on my way home from work today, stop at the ABC Package Store. Okay? So I, I probably, and you're looking at me like something's coming. <laughs> and it is. And, and, and so I pull up to the ABC package store, and it should have come to my realization because this was a small freestanding bi uh, building. It wasn't connected to any other stores. There were no windows in the front of the building, and the ones on the side of the building were darkened. Now, I know you're thinking to yourself, Jeremy, that should have been a red flag to you. <laughs> and you are exactly right. It should have been a red flag. But did I heed it? No. I walked in. And I walked up to the first worker employee that I saw. And I said, I need some boxes. To which he replied to me, um, well, I don't know if we've got any left. Somebody came earlier this week and cleaned us out. To which I was kind of scratching my head. And I'm sure he could see from my body language that I didn't understand what was going on here because, after all, this is a package <laughs> store. Then the reality of my circumstances began to hit me because I began looking down the aisles. And all that surrounded me was bourbon and whiskey and uh, tequila and uh, all sorts of other drinks that I had no idea were you know, all, every variety of beer and light beer that you could imagine. And my face was turning as red as the red wine. Spirit. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, my face, I don't know what spirit came over me that moment, but it, it made me red in my face as red as the wine next to me. And, and so... I apologized to the employee for the inconvenience, and, and I was trying to quickly uh, exit the store without the employee knowing that, yes, I was a fool. Uh, <laughs> but he, he probably already knew, and he was gracious to me. Uh, and so um, that was an awkward situation. Uh, it reminds me of another awkward situation that I encountered when we were living in Washington State. And uh, while we were there, there was a couple in the church that invited us to go up and see the Seattle Mariners play the St. Louis Cardinals. Well, I was on that in a hot minute. I said, sure, let's go. So we went up and we saw the Cardinals. And, uh, well, the Cardinals lost, kind of like they're doing this year. They lost. And so as we were exiting, in the process of exiting, we all needed to make a potty stop. And so I enter into the men's restroom, and there were a lot of comments uh, made very vocally about the ineptitude of the Cardinals, which were directed my way because I was wearing my Yachty Year Molina jersey very proudly, thank you very much. And, and I was prepared for that because I knew I was going into hostile territory. But what I was not prepared for was the inebriated guy who came up right behind me proceeded to turn to the side, unzip his zipper, and urinated in the trash can while I was waiting for the next urinal. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> and so you know, one of the things that I have discovered throughout the years is that having um, an honest and charitable and respectful conversation about the use of alcohol, especially among Christians, um, is, well, it's awkward. Uh, we tend to back away from it and from the topic, kind of like I did in the ABC package store. And then when it does come up, we're kind of shocked, like the guy next to me who urinated in the trash can. Uh, so again, in going places where angels fear to tread, um, we're going to look at another elephant in the room today. We're going to look at alcohol and the church. But before we get started, 
I need to admit to you a couple of things. Number one, I need to admit to you my bias because I'm not a drinker. I never have been, and I don't plan on starting anytime soon. And the second thing I need to admit to you is a statement of uh, transparency, and that's simply this. I cannot make a case for total abstinence from the use of alcohol by merely quoting to you a couple of passages of scripture. I can't do it. So what I want us to do, though, is take a look at what Scripture does have to say about it. And and to start us out, I want us to look at some passages of Scripture that are actually pretty stout in regard to their exhortation concerning the use of alcohol. Uh, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1 has this to say. It says this, wine is a mocker and beer a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. Uh, That's pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? In Proverbs chapter 23, verses 29 through 35, we actually find a strong admonition and caution regarding the use of alcohol. And and I want to read it out of the New Living Translation of the Bible uh, because of the vividness of the language, okay? Proverbs 23, 29 through 35, this is what it says. Who has anguish? Who has sorrow? Um, Who is always fighting? That should be who, not how. Sorry about that. Uh, Who is always fighting? Who's always complaining? Who has unnecessary bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? It is the one who spends long hours in the taverns trying out new drinks. Don't gaze at the wine, seeing how red it is, how it sparkles in the cup, how smoothly it goes down. For in the end, it bites like a poisonous snake. It stings like a viper. You will see hallucinations. And you will say crazy things. You will stagger like a sailor tossed at sea, clinging to a swaying mast. And you will say, they hit me, but I didn't feel it. I didn't even know it when they beat me up. When will I wake up so I can look for another drink? That sounds pretty uh, relevant to present day experience, doesn't it? And now from the New Testament writings of the Apostle Paul... I'm going to read to you both out of the NIV and the NLT for its instruction puts the topic of drinking to excess into perspective. Ephesians 5.18, Paul says in the NIV, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, it's very interesting and also instructive that Paul points out that the excessive use of alcohol... It oftentimes leads to other extreme and excessive indulgences and other areas of human desire and urges, especially that of sexual ones. And we know this to be true from human experience. Now, let me read this to you again out of the NLT. Do not be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so it makes me wonder how many people this verse has been true of, that it ruined their life. How many lives have been ruined because of someone else's actions while they were intoxicated. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting ahead of myself. And again, I need to remind us all in a spirit of complete transparency that there are passages in the scriptures that suggest an alternative understanding of alcohol and abstinence from it. For example, Israel was a wine-producing country, and there is symbolic language throughout the Old Testament of wine presses bursting with new wine, and that was to be used to indicate the blessing of God because of the people's obedience. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 through 10 has this to say out of the NASB. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. If I take you to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 12 through 13, you find this. Then it shall come about, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord will... Bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain and your new wine. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 17, and Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 5, wine is actually part of the tithe. 
And in Psalm 104, verses 14 through 15, the psalmist shares that he actually gives thanks to God for causing the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the labor of man so that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine, which makes man's heart glad. Now, I also need to tell you that there are other passages from the New Testament as well. Uh, In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul gives the following uh, medical advice to his protege Timothy when he says, no longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. There's other realities that I have to take into consideration. Uh, Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine at Cana. I can't get around that. Uh, The cup, the communion cup of the New Testament was not Welch's grape juice. Okay? So uh, the biblical record, if if we go through it, I I believe is pretty clear. Drunkenness is a sin and is strongly prohibited in Scripture. But as much as I want to try and find it, prohibition is neither commanded as law nor practiced as a rule. Now, this all being said, I feel like I need to share with you what the Church of the Nazarene believes about this, what our statement is, and and what the Church of the Nazarene calls its members to in regards to practice of alcohol. And I quote from the manual, in light of the Holy Scriptures and human experience concerning the ruinous consequences of the use of alcohol as a beverage, And in light of the findings of medical science regarding the detrimental effect of both alcohol and tobacco to the body and mind, as a community of faith committed to the pursuit of a holy life, our position in practice is abstinence rather than moderation. Holy Scripture teaches that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. With loving regard for ourselves and others, we call our people to total abstinence from all intoxicants. All right, I told you I was diving into the deep end of the pool, didn't I? Or angels fear fear to tread. So why the call to total abstinence? Well, one reason would be because there is a recognizable difference in the alcohol of our day compared to that of the days of Scripture. Um, Just being real, our proofing power in the distillery is much higher and much more potent. It would have taken longer for the alcohol of the day to reach that point. Now, I'm not saying that it didn't reach that point, but I am saying that what we can do today is we can get people drunk faster. Okay? Uh, But more compelling reasons in my mind can actually be found in the effects and the consequences of the use of alcohol. More than 140,000 deaths, 380 each day, were reported in a CDC study between the years of 2015 and 2019, all of which excessive alcohol consumption was the responsible factor. Another CDC study pointed out that 28 people in the United States die every day in a motor vehicle accident involving the use of alcohol, and 88,000 deaths a year are actually attributed to it. Um, another study out there, uh, which was pretty sobering, and I didn't mean that as a pun, sorry, <laughs> that kind of came out. Uh, approximately 696,000 students between the ages of 18 and 24 are physically or sexually abused and assaulted by another student who has been drinking. Uh, Another CDC study, excessive alcohol consumption actually cost the United States of America approximately $223 billion in revenue in lost production. And according to a 2016 research study by the World Health Organization, 13.9% of the population of the United States of America self-identifies as an alcoholic. The countries of South Korea... Latvia, Slovenia, Belarus are ahead of us in that percentage, with Russia and Hungary topping the list at more than 21% of their populations identifying themselves as alcoholics. I realize that statistics can be a very cold and impersonal thing, and, and, and 
we rightly argue sometimes for the validity of the statistics because they can be made to support a person's agenda very easily. Uh, but many people know the impact of alcohol use in a much more personal and intimate way. The police officer who smells it and has to administer the roadside sobriety test. The social worker that has to click the button on the camera to capture the picture of the woman and the, ch and the child who has bruises and cuts and scrapes all over their body as a result of the man in their life abusing them while under the influence of alcohol. The counselor who has to reach for the phone number to Alcoholics Anonymous. The teacher whose lesson will never penetrate the hangover of the student. The plant manager who has to let a good worker go because they showed up to work buzzed again. The mom and the dad who wait up half the night for their teen, they don't know where they've gone, what they're doing, only to find their teenager come stumbling in with vomit all over their shirt, holding on to a bottle of beer. And the pastor who has to console loved ones and friends who are left behind because of an alcohol-related death. You see, for all of these reasons and more, loved ones, and especially knowing my own proclivities toward addiction, I choose to say no to alcohol and its consumption on my behalf, behalf of my health, my family, and my fellow human beings. And, and I know it's just my way of thinking, but I think perhaps the world would be a better place if more people did the same. But some would say, Pastor Jeremy, though, that's you, though. That's you. What would Scripture tell us to do? What would the Bible say, especially in light of the Scriptures that you've already shared with us? Well, actually, that's a great question. And I've actually found an interesting story in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And I really feel like his instructions are some pretty good advice to us regarding our decision-making in regard to the use of alcohol, and perhaps could be applied to other situations as well. Now, context-wise, you need to understand the Corinthian church uh, had started in a society that was full of idols. Uh, think uh, Zeus, think Aphrodite, think Dionysus, all those Greek gods and Roman gods you learned about in high school growing up. That's the reality in which they lived, okay? Temples were erected all over the place, and celebrations were common, uh, animals were sacrificed, the meat was cooked, and it was later served to a gathered up crowd, okay? And, and eating the idol meat was really a social occasion, all right? It was, it was associated with uh, craft guilds, or to use a modern day uh, phrase, uh, unions, okay? Um, it, was, it was done at wedding ceremonies. It, it was done at parties, Okay, so the prevailing thought was that the more meat that you ate, the more you would be filled with the spirit of the gods. But when the gospel of Jesus Christ came to Corinth, well, those new believers, they had some questions. Now, those who had a, a Jewish kind of background, they knew that their story was, it connected animal sacrifices with the worship of Yahweh, the one true God. And the spirit filling of interest to these Christians was not the spirit of the gods, but of the Holy Spirit of the resurrected Jesus Christ, okay? And so some voted in favor of eating the meat, and others didn't. And, and can I just say there was a little bit of a fuss going on. So they asked Paul what to do. And Paul wrote the following guidance in 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13. This is what we find. Now, about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us, there is but one God, 
the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For someone with a weak conscience sees you, with all your knowledge, eating in an idol's temple. Won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. All right. So, you know, there's kind of some tough sledding through this passage. But it seems to me that we can find at least two trains of thought here. And one comes from the basis of what Paul calls knowledge. Okay, so knowledge says that we all know there's really only one God and that all the idol gods don't really exist. So the sacrificed meat has no divine power in it and therefore no restrictions should be placed upon eating it. Furthermore, this knowledge allows us to handle the issue without violating our conscience or our faith in Christ. And when you apply this knowledge to the issue of alcohol, it could be argued That while knowing the potential for damage from drinking alcohol, we have sufficient knowledge to handle the practice. Therefore, we will drink responsibly and not harm others with our practice. Train of thought number one, knowledge. But Paul brings up a second train of thought, that of love. This is what he says. While we have freedom in regard to the issue, we won't use our freedom in such a way that it might harm others or cause them to stumble in the practice of their faith. And in verse 12, we find that we do not want to sin against the members of our family and wound their consciences. Okay, so this is Paul's main thrust or big idea, if you will, regarding the issue of eating meat sacrificed to idols, and I know this is so exciting, uh, but we'll get to the application here pretty soon. So knowledge has the tendency to puff a person up with pride, while love has the tendency to build us up and build others up in the character of Christ. Knowledge that leads to pride can harm other people. Love proactively takes other people into consideration and restrains personal freedom for the sake of our love for them. Now, knowledge that leads to pride can be used to rationalize our personal behavior on the basis of our rights. And so, acts of self-denial, though, can be rooted in a Christ-like ethic and love designed to protect others and build others up in love, okay? So, given this understanding, the question of drinking alcohol could be posed like this. Will I use my freedom to drink and do as I please? Or will I limit my freedom for the sake of loving others? Now, Paul, he continues his train of thought in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, and I want to pick it up in verse 23. 1 Corinthians 10, beginning at verse 23. Paul says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything's constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever's put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then don't eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I'm not referring to the other person's conscience, Excuse me, I'm referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thanksgiving, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? And Paul gets to the crux of the matter. Whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 
do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. I think it is a fair conclusion to derive from all this that Paul is trying to help us understand the need that our call is to act in the best interests of others, not just ourselves. And this means that the one who recognizes the harm being done to others by eating the sacrificial meat will not eat it, and the one offended by eating the sacrificial meat will not demand abstinence for those who eat with a clear conscience. And translated to alcohol, what this could mean is that those who abstain from drinking will not pass judgment on brothers and sisters in Christ who do. And those who see the harm that is done to others by the use of alcohol may, out of love, choose not to drink and not have judgment passed on them for doing so. Everybody still with me? Okay. I told you this is tough sledding. Some of you are thinking, man, I'm glad it's you and not me. I'd like to have friends at the end of this day. So as I mentioned earlier, I don't drink. My lifetime drinking experience is confined to the amount that you get in a cup of NyQuil. <laughs> that and the amount that you get in those prepackaged communion cups. Because in my last church in Nebraska, I had a, well, I won't say what he was. He was squirrely. He replaced my grape juice with communion wine <laughs> without me knowing it. And that's a whole other story. But the, the point of it is this. I hate the taste and, and, but you need to understand, you need to know from me that I have friends and family, both who are Christians and non-Christians, who do choose to drink, and for the most part do responsibly, and I love them deeply, and that will not change, and I share meals with them, and they bring out their beer, and I bring out my Diet Pepsi, <laughs> and I love them. And that's not going to change. And these friends and family, they tell me that alcohol is an acquired taste. And then I tell them, so too is Brussels sprouts. <laughs> and I have no desire to acquire that taste either. You see, I choose not to drink out of loving concern for others and to stand in solidarity with those whose lives have been negatively impacted by the use of alcohol. And I also belong to this tribe called the Church of the Nazarene. And for over 100 years, we've been trying to destabilize the popularity of social drinking by encouraging people and empowering people to say no, even when everybody around them says yes. So where does this leave us? Well... I'm kind of scratching my head on that one too, but I think we could probably say that your choice regarding alcohol will ultimately come down to one of three choices. Number one, if you have no relationship with God or a very small relationship with God, you will likely do as you please. You will drink if you want to or you won't because either you hate the taste, you've got medical issues that would prohibit it, or you see the dangers associated with it. Second, if you have a relationship with Jesus, you will drink responsibly and not to excess, which is allowable, unless your conscience convicts you, the Holy Spirit asks you to stop, or others are harmed by your actions. Or number three, you have a personal relationship with Jesus, and you choose not to drink out of an act of love, for God, for others. Now, here's the deal, folks. I realize that in a message like this, I have not considered everybody's perspective, nor have I been able to give a valid attention to all of the issues at play, okay? And those are valid points that many of you would say, but pastor, did you consider this? Or pastor, have you thought about this? Or pastor, what about this? That's all very valid, okay? What I have attempted to do was the impossible. I have tried to present to you as balanced an account as I know how 
about the subject of alcohol and the church. And now that I've done that, I want to give you some pastoral thoughts that come from my heart to you, okay? To those of you who drink, I would tell you, be alert. When it comes to all forms of sin and evil, Scripture's position, (laughs) well, it's not moderation, okay? It provides us no position for moderation. And human experience bears witness that those things have been a next step for many after the consumption of alcohol due to the breakdown of inhibitions and altered mental state. There have been many in my ministry, and I know Dr. Nash could say the same thing, many who were going to just have one drink, and before they knew it, their lives and the lives of others were forever changed. So my pastoral counsel to us all would be to abstain from alcohol for your sake and the sake of others. Now, to those of you who choose to abstain, I would tell you this. Be careful. Because your attitude towards your fellow Christian who makes different choices in regard to alcohol must not be arrogant, prideful, or judgmental. You're not to come across as though you are superior to them in Jesus Christ. Because, in fact, you are not. And I would tell you, to take the log out of your own eye before you try to remove the speck in someone else's. And by the way, that's pretty good counsel for a lot of things. Now, for all of us, to those who choose to drink and those who choose to abstain, I would say this. Matters of conscience matter. Yours and others. In fact, they are much weightier matters than oftentimes we give credence and credit for. It's something to think about. How our conscience will either condemn us or set us free. How our actions can impair and hurt the conscience of others. We don't give much thought to those things, and maybe we should. So as we navigate the ins and outs of community that we call the church, community in Christ, in which we hold differences of opinion, let's be honest, none of us can agree on the toppings of pizza, much less some of the things that we've been talking about, okay? So therefore, our attitudes and our treatment of each other should be that of respect and consideration of the other person. And of course, Attitudes and actions of holy love.